Hi, everyone. Oh, yeah. Okay, should we get started? Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Great. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Codebase Talk by Neil McIntosh. Uh, my name is Yasmin. I, I run the Creative Bridge Accelerator program at Codebase in Edinburgh. Uh, if you don't know us, uh, Codebase is a tech cluster. We work with startups all across the UK, um, but we have physical buildings in Edinburgh and Stirling and in Aberdeen. Um, unfortunately, these are pretty empty at the moment. Um, so it's been great to have this weekly series of talks to connect with our community uh, and to welcome people who are new to what we do as well. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to Neil for doing this talk as well. Uh, before I hand over, I'll just tell you a little bit about him. Um, Neil is a member of the small group of designers who pioneered the creation of internet-based products and services in San Francisco in the mid-90s. Neil partners with startups, with incubators, innovation foundation and foundations and investors to tackle short and long-term product design objectives, um, helping companies foster innovation in high-growth verticals. Um, we'll have some time for questions after Neil's talk too. So um, if you do want to ask any questions as we go along please pop some questions in the Q&A or in the chat um, and we'll ask those at the end after Neil's talk uh, but for now Neil over to you. Great thanks Jasmine um, yeah it's great to be part of this um, uh, I, I really love, love, the, love everything about uh, uh, Crater Bridge as well I'm looking forward to doing my stint in the uh, in the summer um, it's great to be able to bring creatives into this whole kind of technology space which has kind of been my my thing for the last, uh, well, 25 years, I suppose. Okay, so hi everybody, thanks for joining. Uh, I've been living and working in San Francisco and as part of that kind of tech ecosystem and tech diaspora for the last, um, well, since the mid 90s, it says there. And, uh, um, and what I get asked, you know, more and more, which seems kind of on one level strange, but also kind of understandable is like, what, what exactly do I do? And I'm just gonna characterize that in relation to how I feel about um, my own work and my own kind of position, and uh, at least as it, as it is now. And um, uh, it's really kind of a relationship business. I'm sure some of you kind of already know this, some of you who are designers out there. And uh, I want to really try and do is I partner with decision makers and internal teams to, to, uh, to help them kind of realize a product vision. So maybe there's some, some, um, some research done, some, um, uh, some use cases, some narrative around the, the product or idea, and then, but, but then we kind of, you know, we as designers, you know, a challenge, I think a challenge to explore that, help to help refine and define it, and and uh, and make it kind of flesh, and then and then move it, and then move it one step forward. It's kind of a few things. I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, uh, further down the line. So, what does that relationship look like? Um, Often I am the design team or I'm, you know, the first designer that, uh, that the, uh, the, the company has spoken to or the entity has spoken to or the founder has spoken to. There's a, a, occasionally I mentor and develop an, uh, an existing designer who may be kind of um, um, beleaguered or, 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 or short, on, short on leverage in terms, of the, uh, in terms of being able to make an impact on the, on the company and the culture. Or in the in the event of a, um, something like a like a raise, which is which is very often the case, you know, a large uh, funding round, um, the company's looking to hire and build a, a design and product team. They're moving away from a purely business and product focus to something that's uh, a little bit more um, like audience and customer focused, and again, looking at the breadth and depth of the opportunity. And in, and in relation to that, you know, it's really a, a, a cross-functional process. That's, uh, that's back to the whole thing of telling, you know, kind of explaining to people what I, what I do, which, uh, which, uh, or how I fit in, and really just talking to the silos that exist in every organization, uh, across every organization, uh, in, relation to, in relation to product growth and, 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 and company and product success. So these are these are these start, these sound to me a little bit like general general topics, and they may be uh, that's kind of what I want to talk talk about today. But they kind of, but I'm kind of hitting hitting them at a high level. Uh, they probably could all do with their own talk, but uh, um, I'm going to try and keep the detail down to a minimum and try and kind of make make the point as we go along. So now, so I'm actually going to show a snapshot of the work, so we're not talking entirely uh, in the abstract about about the types of things I do. So this is about a, a minute and a bit long, uh, it's self-playing, so I'm just gonna let you uh, uh, take this in.
Okay. Back to the presentation. So, what's what's um what's kind of interesting about um about the way uh, designers talked about or, or or even kind of um structured uh, uh, these days is it's kind of gone back to the to to the to the era that I'm going to kind of touch on in a minute where um where designers were kind of responsible for for for, for a lot of things or kind of had had more of a holistic approach and a, and a holistic involvement in the in the product and we're more kind of maybe a little bit more brand focused and a little bit more conceptual. Um, you know, latterly the discussion has all been around splitting up design into, uh, into segments of UX, UI, specialist segments, UX, UI, um, in the old days it used to be called information architecture. Um, this, this has all been, this has all been chucked up, which seems to have gone away a little bit. And, you know, there's various reasons, I feel there's various reasons for this. Um, the, um, uh, the, the advent of product management as being a really kind of strong force in, in product development now and product managers depending on their background and who they are and what they want to get involved in kind of assume a lot of those roles. So I think this is kind of, this is kind of a, it feels like a good thing to me and this is what I kind of wanted that, that slideshow to, to, uh, to reflect is that there's, there's, there's more of a focus on, on perhaps what, what a, sort of, a sort of essence of design which is more holistic. So San Francisco in the mid '90s, you know, it was an enviable time to explore a technological revolution. And for me, and we all came from different backgrounds. And for me, as a filmmaker, I was a filmmaker back then, and uh, or at least that was my, my my art school background. You know, the idea of the idea of access and distribution online was just was was really kind of uh, captivating captivating for me because it was one of the things that I felt stood in the way of me creating and and and, and disseminating the work that I, that I wanted to do. And, and in relation to that, the whole idea of narrow casting, connecting with people directly, you know, small audiences, people who were kind of really interested in connecting with you, I, you know, that was really appealing to. We kind of, you know, we had lots of groups going and where we we discuss things in in kind of a, a kind of almost like a closed ecosystem, which got you know uh, rapidly bigger and bigger. And then you know the idea of fund when when funding started to kick in, you know the idea of funded experiments that was just really great. We didn't we weren't kind of charged with having to make money or make revenue. Um, there was there was the you know it was at the end of the nineties, early noughts. There was the whole promise of the uh, IPO, the the, the 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 stock market launch. But um, for the most part, we were we were able to just do things without any uh, without any challenge to, to 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 make money, which was obviously great too. But it's not that we weren't fo focused on entertainment and commerce because we were and, that, and the, you know, the, the big kind of monoliths of existing media. I mean, those were all those were all there for for reference and they were all part of a part of a part of a focus for, for the businesses that were being funded. I touched on this a little bit before, but this, this ability to give form to new ideas and product narratives. This is really this was this felt this, this still feels very relevant. This feels really, really important for the, uh, um, the important part that design um, uh, fits or designers fit. They're, they have the, this ability to, to create, to look at things. You know, we have the tools to, to pull stuff together, um, even in a, in, a, in a rudimentary fashion. And then just, and then, and then, and it's not, that's just not for entertainment or just for the heck of it. It's really to, um, to see if these are viable and if they resonate, how far we can push them. You know, terms you, I'm sure people have heard, um, like prototyping and user testing, they all use these 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 formats. This idea of pulling things together and 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 throwing them out there before they actually go into full blown production, which can be, which can be which which can take a, a little bit of a, a little bit of time. So this is actually conceptual work that I did back then, and in, in, uh, for a for a company for a startup called Quaka, which was a they were like a marquee startup. They raised that raised at the at the time nineteen ninety eight. They'd raised a, a record round. And um, they were you know, kind of taken on big media by um, by creating a strict. Well, we didn't really call it streaming back then. Creating a platform that was was able to um, distribute video uh, data and metrics, and you know from from in, in this, in, initially from from adventure sports, which couldn't really be broadcast in any or or or, or narrow cast as the case may be in any other way. And we were we were playing with all kinds of things back then. These images actually came from from the crew on the on the sail on the on the sailing on the sail sailboat that was that was uh, involved in the the Whitbread now the Volvo race around the world or like yet to become the Volvo race. This was actually from a presentation for um, for GM in Europe to try and get them to sponsor. So we were thinking about how we could we could bring in forms of um, forms of sponsorship, forms of revenue. It wasn't like we were like, like everything was a big kind of fantasy that was funded by. Uh, 
by some VCs on the promise of, uh, of an enormous uh, stock market uh, uh, cash in. So we were looking at, looking at those models even then. Big brands, um, Levi's at the time were really, you know, marquee San Francisco company, but they, were, they, they wanted to, you know, in, in the retail, brands in the retail space outside of technology, um, really wanted to leverage the power of the internet. And, uh, and, and agencies were really big into this. They were called interactive agencies at the time. And these guys were so, were so saw themselves as being so valuable that they, they even sold stock in their companies as well. And, and this is, a, this is a, um, a social engagement portal, which again was all done very manually because the technology wasn't quite, quite in place, obviously, at the time. But we, uh, we were able to connect Levi's with, uh, with the youth audience, which was kind of something they were really, really lacking. This became their most popular online, uh, online experiment or online entity, really. I mean, it was, uh, it was pretty huge for them at the time. Um, publishing, um, you know, conventional publishing like, uh, like newspaper, San Francisco Chronicle, um, I was able to do some great work for them in a kind of a niche state. They wanted to kind of leverage a little bit of the, the online juice, obviously, and, the, and, the, and the, the potential, but not take away from their, um, their kind of their main readership, which was still buying newspapers. So these were so a lot of these a lot of the results we were we delivering were tangible and we're building audiences and ultimately became part of a an essential landscape um, um, that we kind of still we're still connected to and we're still involved in now. So today, um, so in in some respects, I think one of the points I'm trying to make is that the thing not a lot of things have really changed at least uh, as far as I, I I'm concerned. But one thing that obviously has changed is scale. And so now we have all these industrialized standards and, and design models and best practices that, that really kind of, I feel, um, kind of hem designers in um, and product people. It's, it's, really, it's really not just, it's not really just a design team, it's that whole kind of product enclave within, a, within a, a, a company, these companies which are really, really large now. You know, hundreds and hundreds of designers at, at companies like Airbnb and Facebook and Uber. Um, you know, actually, my, my boss from, from, from Quarker is now the VP of design at Uber, and he's, he's responsible for 300 designers. It's, it, it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's mind boggling to me, anyway. And what, what designers sort of often end up doing now, with, um, given that everything is kind of, it's kind of codified and, and set into a, a certain kind of track, is that they is just a search for dashboards on Google. I mean, you can find every, every, every type of, of, of dashboard imaginable. People have redesigned the dashboard. You know, who knows how many thousand times, I, myself included. Um, I think these are actually conceptual dashboards. It's just like their study designers are so frustrated that they just don't, they just want to, they just want to try and, I don't know, just pretty it up. I don't know what it's, I haven't used this product. I just did a search again for, for, um, for uh, um, um, uh, e-commerce products. And this is the one that came up and looked kind of, looked kind of cool. I kind of like the way they presented it. So again, you know, the, 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 the checkout flows, the things that I've done a, a, a million times and that everybody's still, still doing and still optimizing, these things can be, these, these, these parts of the product can actually be, be brought and, and brought into the product without any, without any perhaps any involvement from design, which is, which is often always a mistake. I mean, the one thing that tends to happen with these products, um, which I find again and again is um, you, 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 the, 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 the company or the client immediately wants to wants to um, customize them, which uh, which is is an even bigger challenge often than actually starting from scratch. So solving basic basic problems with the focus on larger ones. I mean, I, I, I guess that's the that's the idea here, and I think that is that is um, that is in theory the way it should work. But I think that that's kind of really happens, and there's this kind of devolution of design where it kind of comes sub, becomes subjugated. Um, partially under under the, um, the the fact that developers can take things from patent libraries and and, uh, and 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 snap on these tools and products and kind of almost kind of not maybe not consciously but cut design out of the whole deal, and then the whole agile sprint process doesn't really work for design either. But I don't want to go too deeply into that. But um, you know, it's it's kind of an ongoing battle. And this is a, this to, to me feels like it's resulted in a kind of a risk aversion and, and, and just by default kind of fitting in. I mean, if you can't compete um, on technology, if everyone's using the same products, the same processes, the same models, the same approach, the same elements, the same everything, then, you know, where's the competition? How can you stand out? 
And then I think in order to assuage the, 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 the conscience, the uh, maybe an elitist kind of this kind of this version to the kind of idea of the of the of a design elite, um, you know, a lot of a lot of um, term terminology and qualities are assigned to the to the work that designers do. Um, and it's not, I'm not saying wrongly, I'm just saying that sometimes they don't really manifest themselves. I mean, empathy, delightful, all these kind of adjectives that, that, that are used. User centricity, which is kind of the, the holy grail um, at the moment, and it's seen as where the, the, the value is built. But there's, there's value being lost in other places, ebbing away in other places as well. And this is something that's, that, that, that's been talked about from time to time, and I think it's, I just think it's so important, there's little or no critique around the, the work of um, the designer in the tech space. And I don't just mean like, hey, you know, I just mean, I don't just mean like turning up and showing stuff to your, to the team and them saying, well, it'd be better if we moved it six pixels to the left or six pixels to the right. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that in film, for instance, there, and architecture and other disciplines, there is, uh, there, there, you know, critique exists in academic practice. There's just, there's so that, and this, and this can lead to, it's going to be a real lack of ethical consideration around uh, around the products we um, um, we create, and we're we're kind of seeing the uh, we're kind of seeing the the downside of that uh, um, um, recently, as it, as the industry matures. And then so then it just becomes an a, a kind of an abstracted notion of, of a solution that you know you know there's the, their designers are broken off into into groups and they're 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 solution oriented, oriented, but they're they're delivering the, the the deliverables are being shoveled into the into the software development process. But there's no there's no ability, there's no space. It's kind of a firefight. There's no their their process looks that their their experience, their 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 ability to make impact is not going to change for the foreseeable future. And this is this is very depressing. Experimenting and speculation. Um, this is something I felt is always important, and it's not always popular. Believe me, it's um, um, often got me fired um, uh, in, in rhetorical and theatrical ways. I mean, really, kind of maybe going back to um, that, you know, some people might argue a quasi old school way of, of uh, approaching the of approaching design and and uh, and the, the art of persuasion. And there, but, but there are many examples. I mean, I don't, you know, I, you know, one could feel bad about it, but there are many examples about uh, uh, about these in other disciplines um, that kind of legendary, and, and and everybody likes to be inspired by that. There's um there's a kind of limit to how much I think there's a limit to how much inspiration that, that exists in in design within tech and and design and tech and products that leverage technology, um, because everything tends to be a little bit self-referential. So you know, conceptual architecture. Super Studio, which are actually you know, have become really hip recently, and they're, they're, they were a, a, a design collective in the 60s and 70s who created who created kind of uh, fantasy scenarios. Um, but they, but but this this was able to point to point real meaning towards the impact that um, that, that construction had on environmentalism, etc. Contemporary art. Some people might argue this is where this is where it all belongs. Where all this kind of you know the stuff I'm talking about. This belongs. It belongs in an art gallery. It doesn't belong in a, in a design studio or or in a or in a software development um, st uh, scenario or startup. But you know I I, I completely disagree. Um, design and art have been uh, have been bedfellows since the two probably since the since the since the two uh, not the two maybe not since they existed but since they both became a thing that we could identify in the early 20th century. Film, you know, you know, richly textured environment with uh, with a with a huge amount of critique around it, and uh, it's you know these these and and, and so many practitioners, uh, Tarkovsky, you know, one of my favorites, a huge influence on me as a as a young filmmaker. Um, you know, these guys were were fearless in pushing pushing the medium forward and working in it, working with it in, in its essence. I mean, Tarkovsky is, is 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 somebody who works in pure film, as he describes. Martin Margiela, um, you know, the the just one of the most remarkable fashion designers of the last maybe seventy years. Um, he's he's uh, he doesn't really qualify so much as a fashion designer. He's uh, he's basically he basically applies again applies all the tenets of conceptual art to the to the creations that he makes. Um, there's a new documentary documentary out about him. So if you don't know who he is, just look him up, and there's plenty of stuff about it on the on the uh, on the internet. 
So at the very least, what can one expect to derive from this appeal to the business people in the audience and thinking, yeah, 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 it's all very fine and well, but what can we actually expect to, to kind of derive from, from allowing designers to go back to being crazy and, and, and throwing things on, sticking things on the walls and, 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 and dreaming big, but not really delivering on, you know, getting stuff done and getting out the door. Well, ultimately a competitive advantage, as I said before, I mean, what else, what else can we, what else can we really competing with right now? Um, Technology is all the same. Um, every, everybody has access. You know, what are we competing with? We're competing on price. That's just a race to the bottom. And also a bit more, more on a personal level, what I observed is it kind of leads to much greater in, in engagement within the team. You know, people talk about being user focused. focused. I always talk about being, being client and team focused. You know, the people I'm working with and for are my first, actually my first concern, because I won't get, I won't get near the, near the customers of the clients unless I can get those guys on board, involved and on board. And I find that, you know, com coming up with, with, um, with somewhat, you know, unorthodox solution, let, solutions, let's call it, let's call it or, um, uh, or showing them things they might not have considered before can really have a really galvanizing effect on, on, uh, on the team. And hopefully it moves the discipline forward so we don't just take everything for granted. Everyone's learned how to, how to, to, to read and use things in a certain way. Um, but maybe that's not the best way. And also as technology advances, uh, uh, you know, as voice and touch and, and machine learning and every, all the advances that we, that, that cause us to be, to be honest, cause, cause everybody, but particularly designers, at least from, from, from my perspective, cause, cause a little bit of anxiety. I mean, how can we, how can we respond to these technologies in a meaningful way if we're, if we're not moving the discipline forward? Another thing that's another thing that's causing a little bit of a, a little bit of I think a little bit of a challenge for for breaking through some of these boundaries is a lot of the theoretical solutions and and and, and models that are that are propounded these days and they tend a lot of them just tend to be really upstream um, and, and not really not connected to to the deliverable to the to the to the tangible to the making making that product flash as I've talked about um, already and and um there's a great talk by uh, a partner called uh natasha yen at um at pentagram where she uh where she kind of pulls apart the idea of design thinking it's a great talk just look at, look it up design thinking is bullshit. and she talks about it just sets the, the problem with design thinking is it just sets the bar way too low um that the that it's all theory all process all post-it notes and not really any you know where, where, where's the where's the design and all this where's the where's the stuff that really that design is really made of you know, post-it notes, not attractive. So the pursuit of perfection, um, just the, the other, the other challenge is that the other challenge that just flowing, throwing it back on the, on the, um, on the designer here is the pursuit of a perfect product um, is kind of a problem as well. Um, there's inherent, and these are the guys that, that talk I listened to recently from the guys from Google X, um, the Google labs, who are talking about the messy, it's called design is messy again, Highly recommend that that talk. Those guys are great, um, very learned, um, but you know, very entertaining as well. And it's like you know, there's no such thing as this kind of perfect scenario for a product. And you know, the spinning, the the the, the, the shimmering spinning iPhone in space with the perfect lighting. I mean, we all know that you know, after about five minutes, the screen the screen's cracked. It's covered in scratches. It's um, it's got stickers all over. It's got some shitty case that you um, I don't know you you had on your first iPhone, which you kind of adapted to fit. You know, it's, it, there's ugliness and chaos and, 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 uh, and behaviors in the world. It, it, there's nothing that's, nothing is, nothing's gonna be perfect. So you have to, to get on board with that as well. But again, yeah, again, back to the kind of idea of a, an idealized scenario, uh, which are, which kind of abound these days. And I think this is what um, a lot of, a lot of companies, a lot of CEOs expect from, from designers is that they, you know, they, we see a lot of idealized scenarios around our lives for interiors and, and, uh, and, and products and, and everything's very same. And, you know, back to Apple, Apple's kind of responsible like, for a lot of that, a lot of that kind of that, that image, that kind of, you know, neatly white cubed, perfect image of things. And this is what a lot of, I think a lot of CEOs kind of expect from designers, you know, we want to look like Apple, we want to look like, kind of, we want to create a, um, we want to control a controlled perfect environment because that's what, you know, that's what we want, that's what people want. And it's a, it's a way of kind of soothing the anxiety about uh, either a new product or, or just the future in general. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of anxious not to, to stand out too much uh, with this product because we think it might be, we think it might be really crazy or it might be really good. But 
by the way, we just want to kind of take it one step at a time. So let's just be like everybody else. And accept, so accepting that imperfection, accepting the, the, the chance that you're, you're going to fail or you're not really going to kind of, you're only going to come through first time around. I mean, that, that seems to me to make perfect, to perfect sense. I mean, this is, this is the, you know, this is, this is the new frontier still. Um, you know, why not just, uh, just accept that? Real estate exploration, um, absolutely. I mean, it's just got to be, it's got to be just, you just got to, you know, can't, can't say that enough. And heuristics and staying independent from, um, from the kind of, the kind of, the closed ecosystem of, of, of tech. Um, uh, you know, again, back to the, the data design, the designing, designing with data or data driven design. I mean, it's kind of a, it kind of doesn't really make any sense if you're a, if you're a new product, a new entity. I mean, yeah, sure. If you're a massive organization with uh, streams and streams of data coming, pouring in every second of every day, uh, sure. You can, you can tweak it and maybe learn something from it, but you know, initially you just got to take a first step if you're, if you're new on the block. So show form opportunity implication. Um, you know, that's really, that's kind of really what, what I feel that the designers need to be doing and, and, and focused on and, and, and product people and, and companies and by, and by association companies in general, company, the company founders in general, um, try, you know, but, but as an engaged United team, so it's not a case of bringing design in late, which happens so often just to kind of change things, things up a little bit because there's a, there's a problem uh, that they think a designer can solve or, or in the case of, of, of a lot of companies, a lot of reports out right now, how um, you know, companies have been hiring designers 15 to the dozen, and then but the report, there was various reports being published recently um, in the kind of aftermath of that, uh, studying whether or not CEOs and, 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 uh, and heads of product, et cetera, think that uh, design, what, what, just basically asking them, what do, what do your designers do? What do your heads of design do? And they don't seem to have, still don't seem to have any idea. Um, you know, making that room for fantasy, um, which is challenging, which is, uh, which is it's not going to be for everybody. It's about, you know, before one would take that step, you'd have to kind of gauge an appetite and, uh, and be kind of maybe secure in your position within an organization before you, uh, show something crazy to anybody, anybody who might have authority to fire you, etc. All right. Thank you very much. That's, um, that's all I've got for now. Um, um, hope that all made some kind of sense and some kind of resonance to people. Great. Thank you, Neil. Thanks so much. Um, uh, people, uh, I, I think there's a applause button somewhere um, that you could use as an emoji if you're, a, um, if, if you're a participant, but I'm just gonna do that for now. Um, uh, please ask questions. Um, there's a Q&A and chat um, options there for you to ask questions. So um, I'll get us start, started off, but yeah, please pop your questions there if you have any. Um, so Neil, um, one question I've got is um, the idea of pursuing fantasy. Uh, you talked about designers being caught up in the rigors and restraints of process. Um, how do designers convince their managers to let them pursue fantasy? Um, yeah, so that's, um, uh, that is a tricky one, absolutely. I think it's, uh, it's, it's really about feeling uh, secure enough or, or, or being, perhaps being able to make a case for it. Um, with, you know, with, with data, with some experiments that you've already done with some kind of feedback from, from customers, but, but um, just the, just, just maybe showing that the, the existing path is, is just not working. And no matter what you can do, no matter what you do, it might make sense just to try um, to, to, to move a little bit extra. I mean, a lot of what I do is tactical um, and uh, initial initially, and uh, you know, you're kind of building trust there um, uh, in, in, in one's ability to, to, to perhaps, perhaps influence growth. And then maybe you come in with the holistic kind of uh, uh, more fantastical approach. And then when I say fantasy, it's, it, it's, it's not necessarily something that's kind of unrealistic. It's just something that maybe, um, maybe is a little bit beyond what, what, um, what the company or the, the founders or the, or the team were thinking initially. It always helps, it may get rebuffed but it always helps to look at, or it may not make, um, as a lot of things I've done, may not make, uh, make the cut, make prime time, but at least it kind of, uh, at least it spurs, I think it always spurs discussion. And do you have, uh, can you think of any companies that are, that are doing design the way you think they should just, just now? Mm, yeah. Um, well, I mentioned a couple of, couple of people. So some, I mean, these are, 
you know, these are pretty obvious, but you know, sometimes these are the only companies who, who are really able to, um, to make, uh, to make good grand gestures or in a position to make, uh, to, 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 to make the time to, to, to do these things. I mentioned Google X, Google Labs. I think, you know, I think from what I can, from what I can tell, I'm not a huge expert on them. Uh, I, I want to can tell they're, they're thinking about things in a kind of, uh, in a kind of, you know, fairly exciting, realistic way. And, uh, and, and, and the, uh, the challenges that Google, Google have solved over the years, I think, uh, you know, I've referenced them a lot for, for just detail um, around these things, around certain things, uh, around their products. And obviously they're able to fail um, uh, wonderfully in, uh, in, in glorious ways, which, uh, which very few of us, I think, have, uh, have the opportunity to do. Um, I mentioned Pentagram. They definitely do a lot of great work on the kind of periphery agencies like that have been around a long time and really kind of and have, have, a, have a sort of almost learned approach to, to what they do again. Um, and again, bringing in, bringing in, bringing in influences that are not, that are not sort of part of, again, part of a closed ecosystem or self-referential. I think that's kind of a, that's kind of a big challenge. Um, obviously there are lots of individual designers. I, I don't really know them by name, but I see a lot of great work that people have done, that small studios have done um, on, on, online. Um, you know, people who are really working, both working maybe on the periphery of, 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 of startup, startup culture. I mean, they're not specifically working for startups. They find they can do more creative work with different types of clients, but there's lots, there's all, there's lots of good stuff out there. Definitely. It's not like design is dying. It's just that it's, uh, it's just that in, a, in an, an ecosystem, a large ecosystem, a large corporatized ecosystem, it can, it can get a little bit subdued, even though it's been at the same time being pumped up, which is kind of a, you know, contradiction, really. Great. Um, we've got a question from Julia. Um, just for context, Neil, Julia is one of the Creative Bridge um, participants um, cool. this, uh, in this cohort. She's an artist. Um, she's asking, um, how do you define a tech designer? Um, and are you designing products or tech for products? Um, tech designer. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's more about focus, I think. It's like, where, where's, your, where's your key focus? I mean, I, I, I didn't start life as a designer, so and I, I got drawn into it as uh, purely through technology, the internet, start of the startup ecosystem and being in a certain time and a certain place. I think there's some, um, uh, but yeah, in terms of definition, it's someone who, I guess it's someone, you know, just to, sorry, not to skirt around the question, Julie, just to get, get back on it. Is it someone who really understands um, how products go together and kind of the technology behind them? Not really understands, but kind of has, a, has an, an appreciation and understanding, understanding what developers do, what product managers do, um, how the, that all goes together and you're, you're able to kind of communicate, work together and, uh, and, and create and hopefully release something that, is, that, is, that either leverages technology or is tech focused. And it could be B to C, it could be B to B, it could be, it could be any of those things. It doesn't, does, the, the, the space doesn't really matter. If you're creating a, if you're creating a product um, that leverages tech, then you're probably uh, designing tech. Cool, thanks Neil. Um, yeah, if there's more questions, please, um, please do ask in the Q&A uh, and chat. We've got uh, another question from Chris Speed. Um, Chris is asking, uh, Chris is saying he loved the inclusion of the artists, the cinema makers um, to expand the spoke of creativity. Should we let the wild be wild or do we need to expose them to data and methods uh, and tech stacks? <laughs> nice one. Um, bit, of, bit of both, bit of both. I think it's, um, it's all, I think I've, I think the feeling is for there's a, there's a coming together. You, you know that's a great that that's a great uh, that's a great insight there. And uh, um, there's more to always there's more to this than just um, deriving inspiration from from those people. But yeah, I think design should be a little. But I think maybe I, and hopefully I'm answering your your your, your question, Chris, and not just skirting around it. But um, I think design should be should stay a little crazy. Um, Ad Reinhardt firm famously said. Art should be business like, but never like business. And I think the same could be said of, of, of design in this context, because a lot of a lot of the conversation is is around you know designers need to learn the language of business, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, really? I mean, come on. Um, maybe um, they should they should learn to learn how to communicate, but the language of business. 
you know, they should, the design should still be a little crazy, definitely. And exposed, but um, I guess I haven't really maybe quite specifically answered Chris's question. Um, exposing the data, uh, uh, um, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and bring those, bring those two sides together. That's what we're, I think that's what we're, I mean, that's what, that's, that's the, that's the fork in the road. That's the point that we're at. I think that's, uh, I, I completely, yeah, endorse that. I think that's fine. Bringing, there shouldn't be two tracks. There shouldn't be creative industries, data industries. They should be enmeshed and, and uh, live happily ever after. Um, well, what if you're a designer who runs your own business? Shouldn't you understand business then? <laughs> uh, well, you have to do that by default. Because, yeah, good catch. They have to do that. You, know, you have to do that by default. Believe me, I ran my own studio for eight years and I spend most of my time just, you know, doing, doing stuff that I absolutely loathe. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, you definitely, if you're running your own business, you need to know what you're doing. Um, but that's something you can, I'm a big believer in hiring professionals though. I mean, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, work on my own teeth so I don't do my own taxes and stuff like that. I don't think you need to learn that kind of stuff. But more the language of business is like, it's more about being able to communicate with the, the C-suite um, because the, the thinking is that, that um, business people don't really know what designers are talking about uh, half the time. Yeah. There's, a, there's another thing is like your design is full of jargon and uh, you know, God, like business is not, I mean, come on. So I think there's, a, there's faults on both sides. I think they're, me, again, meeting in the mirror, middle I mean, that's really, that's really the, the, the least that we can expect. Well, on the subject of hiring a professional, that's a good lead into our next question from Martin, which is, um, how do you leverage design if you're a new founder with no budget? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, that's, um, that, is a, that is a problem. Um, the last thing you want to know about, I guess, is that you not only need, a, need, a, need technology and then perhaps marketing and then and to learn a whole bunch of new things, you need to kind of engage with, uh, with a designer. Um, it's not slowly um, having a conversation. You, you, you've identified, like I mentioned earlier, I do, a lot of, I do a lot of tactical work initially for a lot of the companies I work with. Maybe, um, can everybody hear me? I got a kind of instable internet. You, you sort of slow down a little bit, but it seems okay just now. I think that might have been. No. Can you hear me? No, uh, um, no, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, so engage. So uh, look, look at maybe uh, there's actually people out there that call themselves growth designers now, and they work a lot with uh, with uh, across the board. But it's kind of a thing that's focused on on metrics and and uh, and adding value where it's uh, where it's needed. Or uh, adding adding impact where it's needed, and that's that's actually I, you know in other presentations I've talked a lot about that. Is that you know I tend to I tend to get involved when when I can deliver the most the, 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 the biggest the biggest impact. Um, you know that point as I was saying where you know it goes from a, either an early early adopters early traction to to something a little bit deeper and and broader, and and I think that's uh, that's a good time to at least have a conversation. But how do you work with somebody with no budget? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to talk to anybody, um, um, uh, budget or not. Thanks. Um, we've got another question from Tom. Uh, Tom says he loved your talk, Neil. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tom. Could you expand on how your approach contrasts to agile or lean methodologies? How contrasts? Um, well, it's yeah, it's. A, I've never felt comfortable. I mean, I'm not going to not going to go into too much detail and, and and define you know go 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 through the whole kind of um, uh, I'm not an expert on agile and and, and even lean particular particularly. But um, yeah, I've always felt, especially agile software development, it's that design never really fitted in, um, and it still doesn't. And and I know and again, people you know people like the the Google guys, they kind of they, well, they kind of co opted the idea of. Uh, of what agencies have been, agency have been, have been doing for, for a while with their design sprints. So they're trying to, again, that's a perfect example of how design is trying to speak the language of software development and, and therefore by default business. Um, but I think the question was, how does it contrast? Um, it's, it's, it's maybe the, I may be the, maybe the diametric opposite. Cause I think that, I think this, I think that the process of design is, is, is iterative. It just, it just, you just keep trying things until you, until you kind of keep trying things and putting them out there until you get it right. And sometimes it's done by instinct. Sometimes it's done through a feedback loop. Um, it's, it's often really hard to map that onto a, to a, to, to sprints, to two week sprints. Um, 
it's you know design what i found is that what i've been charged with often is to kind of be two sprints ahead um give enough give uh, developers enough to work on so we can keep the velocity etc cetera, etc cetera. but that's that's not really that well that breaks the process for a start it becomes more waterfall because there's no design should be there at the beginning the middle and the end it can't it's not just there at the beginning and then you just everything just gets shoveled off into the into the ether and you never you're not able to kind of re, you know um, um, retrace your steps and, and look at and look at what you've created and then maybe kind of make make um, make uh, uh, make tweaks to that so um, I'm not sure that what I'm propounding is a is a, is even a, um, a methodology it's maybe like I'm like a personal personal approach so I'm not kind of going up against the established um, norms necessarily but i'm just i guess i'm just highlighting how they they don't always work they don't necessarily serve because they're not built to serve the process that i i kind of understand i don't know if that really answers your question tom but it's a bit of a ramble tom Hopefully if you want to uh, tom if you want to ask a follow-up please um, please chat or you can also raise your hand if you want to talk um but in the meantime um i've got another question from susie which sort of relates to that as well and um, she's asking in your work what metrics do you use to what metrics do you use to gauge how well the design process is going on a project and um, is there anything specific you find useful as a feedback loop which helps communicate with designers great yeah no absolutely i mean the uh, so the the most useful metrics the most useful feedback for for designers and you know susie probably probably know this is uh it's positive feedback uh I mean, qualitative stuff doesn't really tell tell uh, tell us anything. I mean, it obviously tells tells part of the story, but not a story that's really kind of actionable. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the usual the usual really. I mean, you don't want if something is something is broken or not converting, then you definitely don't want to keep pursuing that. That so I'm kind of I'm kind of I'm kind of beholden to those those laws of um, of uh, of the game. And um, what was the second part of that question? So it disappeared off my screen for some reason. I was reading it. There was a second part to it. It's, um, is there anything specific you'd find as useful as a feedback loop, which helps people communicate with designers? Oh, the feedback, right. Um, so people that, um, I'm not sure I fully understand that, um, but I think I, I think I like it. I think I like where it's going. Um, <laughs> A feedback loop that helps people communicate with designers. So, okay, so maybe like like feedback on what you know. I see. No, I do understand. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it right. So, um, it's more like more around. So you present something, and then somebody, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Susie, but you present something, and uh, and you're just faced with stony silence or kind of subjective, subjective uh, uh, remarks that don't really help you help you move the uh, move the ball up the court, move the move the product, move the design forward. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a very real. I think that's I think um, I hope I hope I've got that right. That's a, that's a really, very real problem. Um, you have to be really, you know, when you when you're doing presentations, when you're critiquing work internally, um, which I think was what we're talking about here. You have to be very clear on the type of feedback you want, and you have to remind everybody in the room um, where where you're at, where you where you've been, decisions you've made, and where you're at. So you don't constantly keep um, keep showing the same thing and just trying to throw something against the wall and hoping it sticks. Um, so be very clear before before presentation at each uh, each iterative stage what uh, what what type of feedback you want. You don't want subjective feedback. You don't want stuff around the, around the colors and and the fonts. You don't even want to talk about that stuff. Ideally, you just want um, you want sp very specific things from from the audience, from the people that you're presenting to. It's it's a tricky one because um, uh, the slightest thing can throw those presentations off. I absolutely, no, only too well. Yeah, so Susie has posted a short follow-up. She says people are afraid, she, she agrees with you, and she says people are afraid of talking to designers if they're not designers. If they're not designers? If, if, if you're not a designer, people feel afraid of talking to designers. Really? That's interesting. I'm not sure I've ever encountered that. Maybe you just um, didn't know now. <laughs> I, find, I find maybe that, well, maybe, no, I can understand that. I'm not going to discount that entirely, but I find that, um, I don't know, Susie, don't you find that everybody is a designer, everybody's an expert? Uh, on design, but uh, but no one would dare talk to a developer about you know about the the code that they're writing. I think that that seems to be more the often more the case. Um, the, there's too there's too much design. Often I feel there's too much kind of you know shallow um, interface with design in the world right now. It's a real 
it's it's everywhere. Everybody kind of feels they know they know what it is and and can can bring it into their life, which is good, which is good too. But 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 bad if you if you're if you're trying to kind of um, if you're if you're trying to put forward an expert point of view that perhaps the other person doesn't really have. I mean, like I say, nobody would try and be a I'm a big believer in in in, in expertise, although I I'm I'm, I'm a confirmed and professed generalist, but you know, like I say, I don't like doing my own taxes. I wouldn't operate. I wouldn't uh, work on my own teeth, et cetera, et cetera. I, I go to experts for that, to do the same uh, for design. <laughs> so Ma Ma Martin says he agrees with you. Uh, too many people are willing to critique design on the basis of their opinion, and too few are willing to challenge devs in the same way. Yeah, nice. Thank you. Well, so that's just that's not a question, right? That's just like a. That's just Martin agreeing with you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Um, then we do have another question from Anna. Um, she's asking um, if someone has artistic, artistic skills, um, things like life drawing and traditional drawing, how, they, how can they move into the graphic design world? What kind of abilities do they need? Mm, wow. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. God. Tricky. I'm trying to think of a short answer. I feel my answers are getting really long, but I'm trying to think of a short one. Um, So first of all, first of all, I think maybe I'll throw that back um, and say, um, uh, sorry, can I say it? it's Anna, yeah, Anna, and ask why you want to make that make that transition. Um, is it because you feel that there's? I imagine it. I'm just guessing. It's because you feel there's a living to be made in 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 the applied arts that that is harder, that is more elusive and harder to be made in 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 in, in the non in the world of uh, artistic endeavor. But um, uh, so I think, uh, and it's actually, it's interesting. I saw this a lot. I saw this a lot back in, uh, back in the old days, <laughs> back in the, in the beginning, the beginning of all this, a lot of people got involved um, in design and, uh, and other, other, other discipline, other tracks as well, and other parts of the organization as well. Uh, in the early days of the startup, because there was, there was a lot of money to be made and nobody really needed to have, and the bar was very low and no one really needed to have much of a skill set to really kind of really get involved, especially at its peak around 99, 2000, I mean, the people were just hiring bodies and putting them in these um, immaculately renovated uh, um, warehouse spaces. So, um, uh, but, but so what always kind of, and it was, it was interesting, and I'm going off a little bit of a, a tangent here, but it was interesting that, you know, the, the idea of being, as, it, as, we were, as a lot of people were called then, a web designer was kind of almost laughable at the end when the, when the dot-com bus came and everyone, everyone just kind of thought that, you know, everyone's a web designer, how hilarious, how kind of, how kind of naff. And, uh, and uh, so, I, and it, that, that obviously that didn't just, it kind of offended my sensibilities on, on multiple levels, but what I, what I realized that, the, you know, if you, if you were no longer, if you were, I mean, a lot of people were just kind of literally in San Francisco, the Bay Area, people just switched from tech, the tech space, the startup space to real estate and to law. So they went back to what they were doing before because they thought the whole thing was over. It was just been a little, it was just like a glitch, some glip, a blip and a glitch on the landscape. So they all went back into things like that. And I thought, well, you know, you were never passionate about it in the first place. So I'm kind of getting back around to your question, Anna. It's like, you, you got to be kind of passionate about that. If it's like, oh, I, I have some drawing skills, I have some skills which I, which I feel I could apply to, to, uh, to design, to, to product design or graphic design, you got to feel, I think you got to feel, and this is, this is not, I don't want this to sound like, you know, follow your, pat, follow your passion speech because that's kind of been a little bit debunked lately. But you, you got to have some kind of interest and some kind of passion to, to want to do that. And I think that's where it, that's where it begins. That's where it starts. Um, uh, and, and, and look at things, look at, look at things, look as, look at as much stuff as you can, the things that you feel are, um, are held up as, um, as, as examples, um, of, 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 of great design, either inside or outside tech, just, just, uh, or in, in history or, 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 um, uh, concurrently or currently. Um, and just and, and try and get a sense of how how those things exist and operate in the world and, and what's really going on there there because graphic design is really about about manipulating um, ideas symbols words um, all those elements into something that's that's uh, that communicates in a kind of subtle way so much like much like art so I think art designer like I say very very intertwined but in a, in a way that's kind of maybe more focused, it's really commu communicating something very straightforward rather than something a little bit more, um, a little bit more um, open to interpretation. So you could, yeah, you could argue that art is open to interpretation, design should not be open to too much interpretation. 
So I hope that helps. Um, I'm happy to, you know, talk more if you want to reach out. Great, thank you. Um, we've got one question from uh, Julia, and then we might have time for one more question if anyone, um, if anyone wants to unburden themselves. Um, but uh, Julia is asking, um, can you give an idea of a project that you're working on or a case study just now, so she can understand a bit better about what your role involves? Okay. Um, yeah, I actually have a have a have a, a classic that um, that. Um, it's actually finished up at the beginning of the year, um, but it was kind of a, it was kind of led me to to, to really think about a lot of things that I, that I've that I've that I've touched on today. Um, so I was a first time founder um, who had done who had actually been germinating this an, an idea. Um, she she was not from, from a tech background. Um, she was obviously living in San Francisco. Her husband works for Stripe. So there was obviously, as, as happens in a place like San Francisco, you know, people are exposed to, you know, exposed to the, to the business of technology a lot. Um, but hers was not, uh, not necessarily a tech play, but it was um, something she'd been germinating for years. Uh, and actual fact, as it turned out, as well as doing her day job, et cetera, et cetera, her kind of background was in finance. Um, and, um, but she was a first time founder and she'd done an enormous amount of research. She came to me and done an enormous amount of research and she assembled quite, you know, quite a kind of, uh, an interesting team actually. Um, uh, people who were another, actually another designer, incumbent designer who was actually, uh, who actually had a lot of experience in the space that she wanted to tackle. Um, so we had a lot of use, she had, there was, a, there was a lot of kind of chaotic research that she'd done, uh, with the target audience group and use cases and, um, there's reams and reams of, 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 of text at Google Docs. It was just, you know, it was kind of a little mind numbing to be honest. And, and I was, you know, I, I was kind of, so I was brought in to kind of make, make, well, first of all, I was brought in to kind of actually create a kind of branded face to, to, the, uh, to the product. We kind of worked, we tend to, oftentimes it, you know, the, the projects tend to kind of often work back to front, front to back, you know, sideways. It's a, they're not always kind of a linear progress and the way, way, way one might, might like them to be. And, um, and part of the problem, part of the reason that she'd been introduced to me was that the current designer that she'd been working with was more of a, more, his expertise was not in, in, in really kind of uh, creating something that was engaging, at least not for that audience. And so his, his initial designs had been, had been resoundingly rejected by the, by the target audience to the, to the point where one of them had suggested she speak to me because I knew that person. And, uh, um, and uh, so that's kind of how we started off. But then I realized that from a kind of product development perspective, these, um, these, these, these notes, these use cases were just were, were chaotic. And, and we brought on, and, you know, I met um, other members of the team as uh, an interim CTO, like I said, the designer, and then we were looking to hire a front end developer. Uh, and we hired this guy in, uh, in, in Costa Rica. And we, um, we, uh, we, we, I had to kind of, and this was all done concurrently and kind of, I hadn't really had time to catch up with all this kind of crazy use case stuff. So I had to kind of, you know, extrapolate out of this, this, this kind of, you know, relative chaos, um, some, some use cases, some actionable um, interface elements and flows that people could actually interact with. And this guy could, this guy could build um, remotely. We we're all working pretty much remotely, by the way. So um, which I've done a lot, obviously, over the years. Uh, it's just more, often more effective. It certainly saves money uh, when we're talking about budgets earlier. So that was, but that was my role was to try and explain. I think explain to her um, how and why this these use cases because there was a kind of what I realized that the, I realized when I started to do when I, when I kind of embarked on this process that the that the the transition from use case um, from list of, of of this from this narrative this product narrative to 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 uh, to an act to, to UI to kind of a hard UI something that somebody could actually interact with, um, there was kind of a real disconnect there for her, and she kind of found this really problematic. So we had long, long, long discussions about about that kind of connectivity. So um, about how these two things came together and how these how products come into being, and it's really hard if you haven't done it before, and it's often and it was you know it was you know a lot of the times it was. Uh, it's kind of one of those things that's hard to kind of hard to explain or even or even show at times and and uh, and that was that was that was so that was kind of challenging for me but that was kind of my role there um kind of all over the place it was it was both frustrating and rewarding and 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 that also you know but you but you learn from those experiences um and um yeah hope, hopefully that gave some uh, some perspective
Great, thank you. Thanks, Neil. And um, uh, that takes us up to time. But um, I know that uh, uh, did you have a slide with your LinkedIn and contact details? And I'm not oh, sure if that sure, came sure. up actually. Um, but yeah, if if, if you want to chat to Neil more, please do get in touch with him on LinkedIn. And you know, when Codebase Admiral is able to open again, he he's usually a frequent visitor. So hopefully, you'll get a chance to meet him if you haven't already. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Neil. It was so nice to hear more about um, about what you're working on and your thoughts. And I look forward to chatting to you much more about that in the future as well and um, those are neil's um details just on the screen there um but we'll, we've been recording this talk so we'll release the recording pretty soon look out for that on our youtube channel uh, next week's talk is with ashley gallagher from qa um, i'm just going to pop the sign up link in the chat just there so um so do join us next week if you're able to um but until then thank you so much neil and thanks everyone for joining us take care thanks thanks everyone thanks yasmin thanks thank base. it's been awesome bye, bye. for now bye